Okay, everyone. I'd like to welcome you back to the UCSD CTRI KL2 seminar, seminar series. Uh, if you recall, last month we discussed issues in uh, grant writing, uh, uh, industry grants, career grants, and uh, R01 grants. That will be available on the CTRI site. It'll probably be up uh, another week or so, uh, as will this session today. From time to time, we'll be filming. Uh, today's session is the first of two sessions on biostatistics. Uh, this is a crucial area of learning to write as if your life depends upon it, uh, your academic life depends upon it, because Biostatistics is absolutely a core feature of all research uh, endeavors. Learning how to do it, how to describe it, how to write it up is terribly important for all of our development. <coughs> I'd like to welcome our two presenters today, Lenny Xu, uh, Professor in Biostatistics, and Murray Steen, Professor in Psychiatry. Uh, each of them will be talking uh, about a different facet of experience. And what I've asked them to talk about, rather than the usual, this is a chi-square, this is a t-test, a much more important point of view, and that is, who do you contact when uh, as you think about uh, experimental design, publications, etc. So with that, Lily. Just wondering what question Mike's going to ask me next. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really, uh, I know some of you, or most of you, um, I know there's a big um, variation. I should um, put this right um, in the audience. So as uh, Dr. Dinsdale suggested, this is supposed to be mainly conversational. So these are not slides I have to go through, like teaching them, but really just to uh, try to bring out some conversations. So they are not in any particular order, but they were in some order till I start to branch off. So anyhow, just some thoughts and... Uh, all right, so... Um, so in terms of design, um, now <laughs> the emphasis here is to talk to, once you have an idea, you probably actually don't have hypothesis because that um, will come back to it again and again. That need to be made more and more accurate over time until you submit um, your proposal. Um, once you have some idea, it's a very good idea to talk to a statistician ASAP. This is for a couple of reasons. So, one of it, and the main one is, if you think of people that you can talk with, probably some of your colleagues working in a similar area, especially your, um, if you have a senior faculty mentor who's been very experienced in the area, including how to uh, write a grant and so on. So that would definitely be somebody you're talking to. But then, otherwise, you think of who would be always working on grants again, 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 right? It's some of us. So especially people who work, um, so at CTRI, we kind of work in a great broad range of subjects uh, and topics. But um, sometimes there are even statisticians, for example, uh, working in a specific area of disease like Alzheimer's, who would be really familiar with that, that area and the design of experiment um, in that <coughs> regard. Uh, another kind of more minor reason um, from your perspective is um, we typically juggle many um, projects at the same time. Um, you can look at, uh, I'm sure you've all looked at the CTRI.UCSD. Um, if you go to, you find the biostatistics page, the page has been moving because they are reorganizing the whole website. Uh, you'll see that uh, we generally request a um, one month ahead of time for grant submission and two months for data analysis. And the main reason is uh, because we work with so many 
um, project. <clears throat> so in thinking about study design, typically you want to think about what's the target population. And also we'll come back to this one um, because whatever you cite in the background section, you cite the background rates that have been published, better match with the population that you propose to study. Or otherwise, you need to justify why that's relevant if you use that um, in the study design, including sample size. And then their sampling scheme, usually for clinical studies, we think it's we think less about it because we take everybody who come to us and I'm going to accrue for two years, then I'm going to do this and that. But that actually relates to the target population, right? Uh, what kind of you know, um, people tend to come to UCSD Medical Center, for example. And then if you're doing biological biomarker or other type of studies, you want to also think about the biological samples, how you, um, how many times you load it on the machine, what kind of conditions to control. And uh, so it really applies a lot. People work in um, epidemiology think a lot about this sort of question. Um, you know, how your sampling matches uh, what you want to study. And then um, the last one is typically narrowly people think of what they come to us for is the sample size calculation. And that relates to actually you have to map out um, the analysis method before you can really do sample size calculation. So, um, I mean, in a simple way, there are calculators on the web website uh, that we link to. A lot of universities host, uh, it's like mortgage calculators. If you know what those couple of parameters to input, you just click button. It really is, if you know what they mean. Uh, it's that simple. You mean so, sample size requirements are lower now as a mortgage rate too low? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that's half of it. Of course, the other half is then what are we trained for, right? If um, everybody can do their sample size calculation. So really, it's understand the, everything related to it. Um, so I won't go into details in this, because everybody's supposed to um, go through the Quest program and all that, which has bought us that courses. Um, so typically, when you're thinking Think about clinical study proposal, uh, clinical trials proposal especially. Um, typically, statistics, if I pick up a pro um, protocol, I look at three sections immediately. One is the objectives, and then the other two that um, statisticians can have input in. One is data collection, how many data points you are collecting, which parameters, and that should match your um, what your hypothesis or objectives. And then there's, of course, the stats section, which typically has two parts, the sample size, justification, and the analysis plan. So like I said, these are just some related thoughts. Um, I already mentioned, if you quote a background, like for your null hypothesis, a number in there, a rate or something, then your study population should match it. And then you want to, um, sometimes we forget, because not everybody who initially you accrue to the study can be used for analysis. So there are various reasons. In knowledgeable patients, um, you cannot evaluate the primary endpoint. Um, or there's, um, well, never study Never started uh, protocol therapy usually are included in the analysis by intent to treat. But a separate issue that I'm going to talk a little bit about is if you are doing longitudinal studies, a good chance for um, loss to follow up or drop out. And so it's just um, inevitable and substantial uh, portion sometimes. Um, The last one is less of a problem. I kind of inherited these uh, talks over years, although this did originate from um, San Diego. So um, it came from, I think it was Cancer Center. Just sometimes people come up with their own designs to 
say we're going to do this or that. Um, you have to be very careful because the standard designs are well, well understood. So you understand the, what we call the characteristics of that kind of design. Um, if you just, or maybe some statistician come up with an innovative design, you just, just want to be careful that uh, um, it doesn't have major flaws and so on. It, it doesn't happen, like I said, too much um, that I see. So the last to follow up, um, that actually could be a quite serious issue, and I know Mike proposed to study this um, for this uh, KR2 award. Um, the reason, one of the main reasons is that it not only causes loss of information, apparently when you lose some patient, you lose some information, but it can cause bias in your analysis results. So for example, if you one group all the sicker patients were lost for some reason, and apparently when you compare the two groups, your results are going to be biased as compared to what you intended to um, estimate. Um, therefore, if you are doing a longitudinal study, then typically we want to discuss how you're going to assess whether the kind of um, dropout or missingness mechanism going to cause the bias sort of problem. And these are well studied in the statistical literature. And then there are two abbreviations you might see. One is MCAR, the other one is MAR. Under those missingness, because it's at random, then you can probably guess it's not going to cause a big problem. Because you are randomly missing people, so it's not going to affect, um, it won't bias your result. Um, but typically, we'll write in how, in the plan, how to assess whether the missingness um, is such. And the other thing, the reason I use sophisticated is because there always has been method to handle missing data. One is not to include them, right? <laughs> if you don't have it, you don't include it. Now, this, um, this is relevant when you have um, longitudinal study, because I know lots of you do such studies uh, on this campus. Um, if you have some data from a patient early on, and then the patient's lost, um, then what's called complete case analysis will simply exclude any um, patients with missing data. And then there's also the last observation carried forward, which also has been seen as uh, inadequate um, for various reasons. If you're interested, we can go into that. So therefore, there are much, so this means there are much better methods to handle missing data. Um, we encountered them. So I think people should feel free, we are not under time pressure, feel free to chime in or ask questions. So I, I guess I have a question about this. Um, we are contemplating a clinical trial uh, of treatment of HIV in acute infection and recent infection. And we originally didn't think we could do it because we didn't know if we could recruit anyone in the arm that was not getting treatment, if they would just immediately drop out, um, since an incentive is potentially access to treatment earlier than not. Um, if that happens in this trial, what can we do as far as would we need to plan like a futility analysis part way through or I mean we, we just don't know we can't we can't predict how people are going to respond whether or not they're going to stay or or because that would definitely be like a biased loss follow up everyone mm -hmm. you know randomize into the non-treatment arm and falling out because they aren't getting anything particularly from the study. Don't don't know they're not um, in the active Yeah we weren't gonna give them a placebo. It's either like drug right. or no drug. Um, so, I mean, I don't even know if it's ethical to, because people change their behavior based on whether or not they know they're being treated. It's the STD, you know. Um, I'm not even sure if it's ethical if we gave them a placebo. <laughs> yeah, we have um, ethics <laughs> component <laughs> of the CTRI that you can discuss with. It sounds like a feasibility problem of the trial, right? Yeah, you know, it, it's, uh, there's, I'm actually not even a big the person designing this right now, but I'm kind of a, a peon in the study. Um, but there's been a lot of discussion amongst like the big wigs in our division about whether or not this is even 
something that we could possibly do. Um, for a long time, we didn't think we could do it, so we didn't even try to write a grant mm -hmm. saying it. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what about standard of care instead of? Well, standard of care is no treatment um, right now. Okay. Yeah. So, but still, you think people are going to drop out, basically? Yeah, because because they know that you know they go on treatment. Uh, and they bring down the viral load and they can have sex by pounds. <laughs> Where that's what a lot of people think when, right. when they're on treatment for HIV. Yeah. Um, and so, and, you know, it's, a, it's one of these things that's a lifetime treatment. We're not actually doing a, a treatment and stop study, which has been done in the past mm -hmm. in acute infection. Um, so, like, why would you, if you're not in the study to get drugs, you know, I don't know, but it's, right. it's why do you want to be followed? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to be followed and give blood, and, you know, answer all these long questionnaires. Right, for research. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for money, I mean, you can pay them, but, you know, then that's coercion, right? Yeah. So. yeah. I mean, there are methods, like I said, to handle missing data, even if the missingness is going to cause bias. Um, you can, people can model that, or if you can somehow, and that's used more in survey studies or epidemiologic study instead of randomized trials. You can follow up, if you can, a subgroup of patients. You just you know, keep calling them or do whatever. Just get some data and you can model how, what those people are like that's not in your study. And then try to compensate. So how easily these are approved or you know, get funded in randomized trials, I don't know. I'm not that familiar with that, but um, those methods are out there. Yeah, I was just thinking of strategies that we can put in our, you know, the, the section and the grants that always talks about um, your secondary plans in case your original plans don't, don't quite make it through. Um, so I guess you could say we could continue to try to find these people. Yeah, just a subset. That, that's usually the best. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you'd be try all sorts of their sensitivity analysis, assuming how different the ones that you missed are. You know, if you can somehow quantify them, then. Um, but again, I haven't quite seen them for um, primary endpoints in my experience. So. Okay, so um, um, underpowered studies, we've all seen them. Um, basically, um, when we say underpowered, well, when you submit a study. <laughs> always on paper at least 80% power, otherwise you, you don't even bother to su submit. But this is kind of played with the number and cooked up. Uh, you know, you can always detect, target a large difference, and then you will always have enough power, or almost. But the truth is that, of course, your treatment or therapy, whatever, is not so magical, and you never be able to achieve such a large difference. So and you are not really answering the scientific question. Okay, so here's a list of things. Now, I think most of you are probably already know this. Um, what the statisticians need is a primary endpoint, the now hypothesis, what's the alternative, the amount of difference, um, the, the, the rate that you're going to use to inflate your sample size with, basically and uh, accrual rate, so you can project how long it will take to uh, finish the study. I have a quick question for you. At what point in the sample size does the study become proof of principle study, quote unquote proof of principle, which always seems to have lower numbers versus you know, a well-designed, appropriate sampled study. I mean, is there a statistical meaning to that, or is that just something that people put when their numbers are low and they see a difference in something and it somehow relates to science, it's proof of principle? So that's usually the pilot studies, right? Right. Because there's not much data out there on what you want to study. Right, but they also, I mean, at least a few studies I've seen with this um, that come out, I mean, their impact tends to be high because they're novel, but because it also seems like the numbers are low, would they meet most of the definitions still of appropriately powered or not? Um, I think in biomarker or biological studies, sometimes signal is pretty strong. 
So they do only need a small sample size. And uh, in clinical trials, I don't know. Um, Marie, do you have? It varies. I think some clinical trials are proof of principle studies or under powered studies where what you come out of it with is an idea of some idea of the effect size. And you know, sometimes people will say that's going to be useful for a future study. It's questionable whether it really is or not. Um, but that can sometimes get people pretty excited if they see a dramatic difference in you know, driving to SIBO, even if it's uh, an underpowered study, meaning that the findings themselves aren't statistically significant and you know, the usual thresholds we set up. So can you write grants like that? Like say you want, I mean, I'm just curious. You know, I don't know if the grants like that get funded if you are, have a seriously underpowered grant, um, but you can't ask for more N because you either don't have enough time or you don't or it would cost too much money? Um. Well, the answer to that is, of course, you can write grants. <laughs> you, can write <laughs> you can write grants on proving that uh, the Earth is the center of the solar system. Mm -hmm. um. Would those be like an, like an R21 or a for something of that sort? Um. We talked a little bit yeah. about the R21s at the last, at the last session, and um, as as we discussed, many of the institutes are doing away with the R21s because they they haven't been felt to live up to their promise. They haven't led necessarily. They haven't necessarily been the pilot grants that have led to success, successful R01s. Number one. Number two, the reviewer behavior is refractory to change. So that whether it's an R01 or an R21, the reviewer puts on his or her R01 grading template. So uh, I, I think pilot grants are very difficult to get funded. Planning grants are something different. And maybe we'll come back to that. That's a special grant mechanism. But I have a feeling that's taking us a little far afield from this evening's topic. But as I listen to the questions and your comments, what strikes me, and, and this is a sophisticated crowd, so they, they know it already, what, what strikes me is that you're talking logic and experience in seeing lots of studies much more than math. <laughs> I'm sorry if you're expecting a mask. Because I think that's what a lot of people think, that you are the guys who massage the data and out pops a number. And that's not... You do that what, too. You do that too. <laughs> <laughs> go, go ahead. Sorry. But, uh, yes. It is there's a lot, lot more related that we have to look at. Um, so anyhow, like um, Joe just said, this is a sophisticated crowd, so you would all know a continuous outcome or a binary outcome. These are basically the two most common types we see. Um, well, there will be counts and other ones, but those by far are the uh, most common. Now, so I, I do want to mention a little bit about p-value. Um, I'm sure you all know what p-value is. So the thinking, well, just to the whole thing, is a bit like a proof by contradiction, right? You assume the now is true, and then if the probability of having the data you have in hand is really small, typically what we mean by really small is 0.05, then you're thinking, okay, then it shows that now it's probably not true. Because if it's true, how, it's such a small chance I will get this. So the reason I want to mention p-value a little bit is um, there's a very much related topic, uh, multiple comparison, which sometimes we aren't so um, conscious about um, when we are doing it, actually. So the most common single design, you have uh, one Hopefully, after talking to people, including statisticians, you pin down one primary endpoint. Primary endpoint, I mean the one that you're going to base your sample size on, and that usually is the first objective in the grant. 
But sometimes, like um, I think Mike had an example of it. Uh, Alzheimer's disease, you guys will me measure two cognitive function. And I also, just today, learned one of the study I designed a long time ago, they used, um, they study the effect of alcohol on infants, uh, you know, fetal alcohol syndrome, basically. They used the baby's measure. And we went through the multiple comparison and we fixed on um, baby's measure. And then today they told me there are two aspects they want to look at separately on baby's measure. So, um, so basically, there's this thing called inflation of type 1 error, so you need to adjust for multiple comparison. And usually, as you can quickly see, you will divide your usual 0.05 by the number of comparisons. So you quickly lose power. So the smaller your significance level, the more subjects you have to have. And the same applies to when you have multiple arm studies. So if you have a, a control compare, like a placebo compare with the low and the high dose, you have at least two pairwise comparison. Usually you want to compare the low dose with placebo and high dose with placebo. Once again, typically you need to adjust for um, the multiple comparison. And that's typically when you do randomized trial, this is um, a must. And then another type of multiple comparison is sequential monitoring that's sometimes worked into the design so that halfway through the study or more than one place you want to look at the result and uh, make a decision for stopping. The only exception here is for safety. Initially, especially in cancer studies or many other ones because safety concerns so you, you always monitor that and report and they can always, the committee pretty much can always make a decision Although now with um, some of the large uh, vaccine and drug studies, they start to actually account for that kind of um, multiple looks statistically by working in the, um, the power and so on. So, um, and then, so this we have already mentioned. Um, there are people you talk to. Um, there are senior faculty in your area, there are um, statisticians, and CTRI has other resources. If you're going to work with a lab, imaging, or anything else, um, you should start to talk to them ASAP, basically. And also, another thing that we um, I start to notice more and more is about the data management. And when we look at the um, CTRI website, you see there are several options, and that's where we usually point people to because um, really there are a lot more um, data um, collection tools available these days than before. Um, and one thing, this is from our perspective. So the field, as you know, when you're a physician, you always need to get retrained because the field's evolving and there are always new technology coming along. So just to, um, you know, for you to understand that statisticians, for one thing, is for professional development, and they also want to keep up with the new technology. So it could be something that's new that you come up, um, come to us with, and uh, you know we always learn new things. And some of our um, faculty are also interested in doing um, methods research, meaning statistical methods research in the new area. So anything new is encouraged. And, uh, shouldn't shy away from. Um, and the last slide, um, this is just a list of software, it's just to hear if people have questions and uh, anything want to talk about regarding the software. What is your guys' preferred so we use R <laughs> ourselves um, pretty much on this campus in the uh, biostat group it's used a lot but SAS of course is one of the major software including jump it's pretty powerful uh, I'm not sure people use much data here okay it's a nice and a neat little thing but um, I don't think they teach it systematically in our, you know the training part yeah. They teach you SPSS and jump in some programs. And I did my MPH, it was all stated, there was no choice. So. Mm -hmm. Which packages do you all use? So, Armour and Sus. 
I have a statistician. <laughs> I mostly use the the uh, design type stuff, software for graphs and things like that. Sort of like a graph pad version. But that's very very limited as far as multivariate. You can't really do anything beyond a variate comparison. So I get help <laughs> from my big stuff. Uh, Prism, and then when I was writing my uh, KO8, I definitely used the CTRI person ahead of time for some of the powering. Sure. So uh, Lily and I talked about what we would do and figured that um, uh, I'd sort of show you from an end user perspective um, what I might come to a bio biostatistician uh, with, with what kind of questions I might have, and, and then we'll have some discussion about it. So in some ways, I guess this might be what you're kind of what you're going to do um, a month from now, but. Uh, Maybe we can model for you what to do and what not to do. So this is an actual study that I'm unfortunately going to be writing a grant for in the next few days. Um, so these are real questions I have, which will be offered to help them. <laughs> right? <laughs> Didn't think I'd take you up on that. Um, so I, I do trials in psychiatry and. Um, so there's this drug that we want to study for um, post-traumatic stress disorder. I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction. Very brief, this is hard to read. But essentially the drugs we use to treat um, post-traumatic stress disorder now, drugs that are on the market are antidepressants. So SSRIs and SNRIs. Um, and they don't work especially well. So we don't have very good pharmacological treatments at all for PTSD. There's an Institute of Medicine report that concluded the drugs that were out there, um, uh, to use the technical term, sucked. Um, and they actually reviewed, um, and these are FDA approved drugs, they reviewed many, many trials and concluded that they weren't convinced the drugs we use are any better than placebo. For, for depression? Or? For PTSD. Yeah, there's <laughs> there's also been some meta-analyses of the question yeah. of whether they are for mild to moderate depression as well. But um, bottom line is that the treatments we have are not good enough. Um, so there's a drug that's been on the market outside of the United States for um, over 20 years called Tynepine. And um, without getting into details about how, how it might work, it's, it is an antidepressant, but its mechanism is very different than any of the antidepressants out there. So there's reason to think that maybe it would uh, do something, have, have effects that the drugs with similar mechanisms don't seem to have. So most of these other drugs, the SSRIs, they actually um, block serotonin reuptake in the synapse. And that's probably not how they work, but that's what they do. Tynepine actually enhances serotonin uptake into the synapse. Um, and so it's a very different kind of mechanism. Um, the other nice thing about the drug is the main, one of the main side effects of the antidepressants are sexual side effects. And particularly now when a lot of the PTSD that we're treating is in young combat veterans. Um, they do not like having sexual side effects. And so even if the medicine is working or might work, they're very reluctant to take them. This drug Tynepine, because its mechanism is very different, does not cause sexual side effects. So even if it were just a little better than what else we have out there, its side effect profile would make it a, a real winner. So, Lily, this is kind of what we're thinking about in terms of our, of our aims. So we want to see whether the drug works. And so we figured that the design would be some kind of um, placebo-controlled trial. And we kind of have a hypothesis, but I think it probably needs more shaping, where we think the drug is going to be better than placebo on uh, one of our measures. And this measure, the CAPS, is um, kind of the gold standard PTSD severity measurement scale. Um, and we think we want this to be a 10-week treatment study because that's about how long the antidepressants seem to take to work if they work. And this drug, which hasn't been studied PTSD, has been studied somewhat in depression in other countries, and it looks like it takes 
six to eight weeks to work, so we figured 10 weeks should be good. And so our primary outcome would be the change in this measure from uh, baseline to 10 weeks of treatment. We're still not sure how often we want to uh, measure people, whether we want to do it every two weeks or every week. So that's sort of one of the questions I have, whether um, you could provide any advice about how often we should be measuring the outcomes. Um, then we have the secondary aim, and um, I'm calling it secondary, but I'm not really sure what I mean by that, so I'm going to ask you, but um, we also want to see if it gets more people into remission. So another way of looking at it, um, instead of just how much change am I getting on my severity scale. And so we think that more people will go into um, remission in terms of their clinical status on the drug than on placebo. And so uh, I guess we'd be looking at some, quarter, some sort of proportion of people who um, are much or very much improved, which we would call um, remitted or responded on the drug compared to placebo. And I guess I'm not sure whether I want these to be co-primary aims, um, and I'm really not sure exactly what that means, because I've heard it, sometimes I think people use co-primary to say that um, my trial is a success if either of them hit, um, and sometimes I've heard it, they both have to hit. And then I saw you have this slide up about um, adjusting your uh, p-value for multiple kind of comparisons, and one of the questions I have is, does it matter whether I declare the trial success if either hit or if both hit, do I still adjust my p-value in the same way, or is, is there a difference? Um, I don't know, I'll, I'll just do a little more, I don't know if you're going to remember any of this, but we'll come back. So we were thinking of this for the design, this would be a double-blind randomized controlled trial of the drug versus placebo. And we figure we're going to have multiple sites, I still don't know how many. And um, because it's an antidepressant and there's some stuff in the literature that people with um, PTSD may do better or worse depending or not whether they also have depression, major depression, we thought that those should be things that we stratify by, but would like your advice about that. And you know, how many strata we should have and pros and cons of is, you know, there are other things I can think of that might make a difference as to whether people respond or not. I don't know whether it's worth stratifying. Uh, and we think the sample is going to be a combination of military veterans and civilians, but we're not sure about that either because they're kind of different. Um, and there's some evidence that veterans don't respond as well to these treatments as civilians. But I don't really want to limit myself just to veterans because then it won't be as generalizable. I may have more trouble recruiting, but I'm also worried that veterans and civilians might look different, so maybe that's something I should stratify for too. I don't know. Um, and we thought we'd have some level of severity before you get in, because you could have mild PTSD, but then I'd be worried that you'd have a very high placebo response, so we'd want to bring in people that are pretty severe, and this PCLC score of more than 50, or 50 or more would do that. And a lot of people with PTSD have head injuries, TBI, and we think we want them in the study, and maybe that's something additional we need to stratify for. Um, and then uh, in terms of the intervention, we figured it would be 10 weeks, and we'd like it to be a flexible dose, because I don't, this will be the first trial for this in PTSD, and I'm guessing based on doses for depression, that it should be around between 100 and 150 milligrams, but um, we don't know, so we figured a flexible dose would give us the most chance to see what dose works. And I have questions about that, and I think I already mentioned what I thought the primary outcome would be. So I have a whole bunch of questions. I mentioned some of them already, and I can come back to them, but you know, one of my questions is, in addition to, you know, what do you think of the design? Um, how big does my trial need to be and, um, in terms of people and then how many sites, how can I figure out how many sites I'm going to need to involve. Um, and then we haven't even talked about how I'm going to analyze the 
themselves, which I guess is something I'm going to need for my grant, but um, question whether I have two primary hypotheses or primary and secondary. And, um, so that's kind of where I'm coming to you at this point. That's why questions from a very experienced researcher, <laughs> because less experienced may not even think of these as questions. Um, but indeed, they are probably going to um, affect um, the result of these questions. And so, um, what I need usually is uh, a bit of literature to read about your area. Um, so, for example, lots of um, things that will bump into like what you say stratified. What exactly is that? Because in different disease areas and different type of data and therefore modeling, stratified would mean different things. So, um, well, back to the aims. So you said, what's the word? Basically, looking at one at a time. If there's one winner, then you've achieved your goal versus both have to be achieved. So logically, if both have to be achieved, then you're only doing one, um, you know, you only have one thing, basically, you are looking at to make a final decision. So I don't know off top how exactly you're going to do that in terms of power calculation, but I would say no multiple comparison. But if either um, the continuous case achieves a p-value less than 0.05, or the um, dichotomized one achieves 0.05, and you claim a winner, you know, your drug's effective, then I say definitely you need to adjust for multiple comparison. Um, actually, I think Mike will probably have some thoughts on this, because in AD, they were also talking about whether to call a progression, clinical progression, yeah, but the dichotomizing versus not. Right. Uh, yeah, so we, we wrote a paper saying that dichotomizing was a bad idea in general. Um, that was more for a, for a time to event analysis, but I think the same is generally true um, for a binary event. You, you, you lose information when you dichotomize. Um, so if, it, if yeah, you might be better off just analyzing that endpoint as continuous. So I can tell you that like most of the people, most clinicians won't give a darn about some arbitrary change in that measure. Right. Um, and they really want to know, you know, what percentage of people got better or not. And that's kind of why I feel obligated to include it and I'm still, you know, could be secondary, I guess. Um, so I would sort of say the trial's a success if it hits on that primary aim. Um, but I probably still need to have enough people in my trial to also be sure that I have a chance of hitting on the secondary aim. So how do you define revision? Is it based uh, partly on that uh, CAPS score as well? No, it's just based on a different sort of more global measure of literally in my in, in the global assessment of the clinician is the person much or very much improved. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the person doing the rating has knowledge of the CAP scale, but also um, basically it's an overall gestalt of the clinician. And in that case, there is no real underlying continuous measure. Right. right. Ten weeks long enough for that? You said the drug works and starts working if it's going to work in six to eight, and then maybe a remission by ten. Is that a realistic? I don't know. Um, so you know, I could play. I could play it safe and go uh, make the trial longer, but then I am weighing that against a couple things. One is um, it's going to cost me more to do the study. Um, in this case, it's a company, a tiny company, that's um, providing the drug. And if uh, you know we extend it even another month, it can cost them an extra three, four hundred thousand dollars, which I'm not sure they have. And then 
my experience is that the longer the trials go, once you get beyond a couple months, particularly people who aren't doing well, they just get fed up and drop out. So then I start to run into a problem where the only people staying in the trial longer are the ones who've already done well. And if that's the case, then maybe I should just end it at the point where you know people who are doing well by then are doing well, and the ones who aren't aren't. So it's not setting you up for failure, then you think, at that time point. And if that does not meet that, that end point, the secondary aim, um, in terms of the people who take the drug, um, you're still happy if the primary aim is, is met, even though the secondary isn't, it doesn't take away from it, do you think? It does, it's just sort of a, a trade-off, and I'm not sure 10 weeks is right. Maybe it should be 12 weeks, maybe it should be 14 weeks, but um, somewhere around there, maybe 10 is a little short, and I should be better off going a little longer. So it sounds like this is the first study of its kind, nobody has this uh, drug in this population? Not in this population. So it's a relatively small study. Small and... I'm thinking more like phase I thought two. you were going to tell me. <laughs> <laughs> phase two, instead of confirmatory yeah. studies. Yeah it, would, so. yeah, it would be sort of a phase two A study. Right. So if I follow the logic that I learned when I was working in cancer, would be it's more acceptable to use the immediate endpoint instead of the final clinical endpoint. In other words, it's more likely your continuous outcome, even though clinicians may not actively care about it, might be okay. Might be okay. Right. Okay. I'm not that familiar with the CAT score, but um, is there any evidence to suggest that the more frequently you administer it? the better patients actually do, like with other surveys and questionnaires and things like that. Um, going back to your question about how frequently they should be administering Yeah, and in fact there is, uh, I wouldn't say there are data, that a lot of people think that if you keep asking the people about their symptoms again and again and again, that they either get better or they just sort of get sick of answering, and that um, the scores start to come down. So there probably is some trade-off. I'm sure I don't want to ask them this every week. The other thing is it takes 30 minutes to go through the scale, so I really don't want to ask them that every week. Um, so I don't know about every two weeks or um, you know, once a month. I guess it doesn't work out too well for 10 weeks. Maybe I should make it a 12-week trial and do it every four weeks. So my first reaction, seeing your primary endpoint, is that um, I like it because it's from baseline to whatever you think the endpoint is. Because people sometimes get um, confused about, well, if I have multiple looks on multiple measurements, which one should I pick? I want to look at all of them, and uh, that tend to make it less clear cut if you are simultaneously with multiple endpoints. So, um, uh, but if you have to, like in any trial, I know they look for the trajectory or the, the slope, basically, then you have to do that. Then there's a way to calculate how often you want to look and so on. But in your case, again, my limited experience is that people start to take the measurement when they suspect that there's going to be a difference between the two arms. Um, and for future trial, because you have a better sense. So you might, if you can afford to have it a little longer, and then um, unless you're sure by week 10, you should see the difference. But you suspect maybe as early as six weeks, there will be an effect that maybe you'll take. Maybe I mean, for some people, maybe as early as four weeks. Okay, so it will make sense not to measure before four weeks. You probably want to show us the same effect though too, right? So not just a transient improvement. Or, I mean, how what's the duration of therapy? So if, like if the drug worked and we were really treating people, how long were we treating people for? Right, so it's, I guess it's going to be continuous until you've met, uh, stop measuring them and then you take them off? Or how the, how, how's the delivery? Like in reality or in, in a trial well, study? Well, so in this trial, we were going to go to 10 and now maybe 12 weeks. And 
then probably uh, we'll have to taper people off the medicine. Because uh, I don't know if you can stop it abruptly. There's that. And we've been talking with the company about whether um, they would permit at the end of the double blind trial that people um, switch over to open label. And uh, they're not sure they can do that. And they're also not sure that. Um, the FDA will let them do that since there's not long-term safety data yet on the drug uh, in this population. So we were really thinking of pretty much they'd be done with the study at the last endpoint. Okay, so you couldn't, you can't do like a double crossover design. Um, you mean do that change, use a different design and. So why would I want to do that? Well, if you don't know the, the um, uh, how long you, you don't you don't have the other. duration of uh, therapy required to uh, create an effect, you can you know observe one group um, and then you can you know, see what happens after you cross them over to placebo and person. Yeah, uh, so, so you, you have a little more power in the study. See what you, yeah, so we we talked about doing something like that, either um, you know continuing people who are doing well and whatever they're on, and people who aren't doing well, swapping them over to the other arm and keeping it all double line. But um, we decided since this was going to be the first trial with this, that uh, until we can answer the question whether it works, the company doesn't feel they can invest the money, get the investors to invest the money as to how long it works. So we figure we're going to just answer the very basic question, does it work short term? And if it does, then hopefully there will be future trials that would include how long you will be on it. If you're looking at a 12-week block of continuous therapy, right? you can do you know, effectively a, the same amount of medication being given right over that block, but you know, you're giving it in all, uh, in both groups but for a, you know, a shorter period of time. So unless you're certain that you require 12 weeks of continuous therapy to achieve the effect, right. you'll, have, you know, you'll have more information from I think we need between 10 and 12. So um, I think if we were going to do what you're suggesting, we'd need to go to you know, 20 to 24. I see. And what's the cutoff for the CAP score for clinically significant? PTSD. So, um, like, what what change? How much change is clinically significant? Or oh, once so you get down to what level would they would we say that they're probably not sick anymore? Or right, I guess that's what I mean. So you're you're taking all they they satisfy some criteria on that scale for to you know, get in, into the study. Yeah, um, yeah, we, so probably what we were going to do, we could do what you're suggesting is we'd have some um, minimal level on the caps to get into the study, so score of 60, right? Um, what we often, what we've sort of learned in um, mental health studies is not a good idea to um, enroll somebody based on the score of something that you're trying to reduce during the trial um, because there tends to be a tendency for everybody to want to get better including the treating physicians and everybody gets better so we're going to use a different score a different scale it's also a PTSD scale of 50 or more to get people in but then we're actually following treatment with completely different measures so they don't one doesn't influence the other. But it's the same basic idea. There's a severity cutoff. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I, you're asking me a good question. So um, then I'm guessing Lily's going to want to know like, how much change in this measure um, is going to be meaningful to me, or um, do, you know, uh, what number do I need to get below for that to be clinically meaningful? Is that something you really want to know? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so that I could probably, I think I can figure that out from looking at other um, 
PTSD drug trials and sort of see what people have used. And um, so I think I can come up with that number. Sometimes people will use a 50% change from whatever people are on. But I've also um, seen people say like a 10 point change. So if I tell you just that there's a 10 point change or a 50% drop, is that all you need to know or do you need to know no, more? That's actually going to be a little tricky because it's a pre-post kind of design. So you are really comparing the two group change scores. So, and anybody who's played with that calculator <laughs> um, knows that you want to give the uh, difference between the two groups in change scores, right? Or effect size. But in thinking of effect size, you have in mind that um, it's how many standard deviation, basically. Um, the question is then the standard deviation of what? When you just compare the mean, like you take the height of men and women, it's the standard deviation in men versus women, right? But this is a standard deviation of the change score. And that's hard to come by in the literature unless somebody has done it. So then, in fact, I have to um, play a few scenarios, basically how correlated with me the same subject the pre and post scores are. The correlation is another number that I would need either to assume or somehow get it from somewhere. So people study is a little more complicated. And if I say, gee, I, I don't have any idea to know where to get that pre-post correlation from, what would you say to me? So typically what we do is... You need five or two patients. <laughs> <laughs> a variety of correlations. Like usually you get three. If it's 0 0.3, 0 0.5, or 0.8, and you will see a few different sample sizes. So I have a question. Murray, as you write this up, your narrative uh, will presumably be roughly how many pages for this sort of proposal? The whole thing. Uh -huh. yeah. Typical NIH grants, 12 pages. Okay. And how many pages would you devote to data management um, in, in, in your narrative? Yeah. So if you, if we could have that discussion because I think sometimes people don't think about this. The data management. So this is a multi site trial, um, which means data management is going to be. Know, a substantial issue would be less so if I was just doing it at one site than the data management is my study coordinator you know on his laptop um, so uh, you know realistically a third to a half a page probably on data management um, and that's just literally the management the informatics piece of the management not the analytic plan how about the analytic and the statistical power? Um, probably working out to a page and a half to two pages of the 10 page grant, of the, of the 12 page grant. What's your experience, Lily? I tend to write short step sections. So um, typically about a page. Well, it depends on how complex the study is, but um, in many cases, the secondary endpoints can be similar data type as some of the other endpoints. So, uh, yeah. In my experience, uh, if we're not devoting a page out of a 12 page narrative, if there's not a page that is set aside for data management, statistical power, analytic plan, we're in deep trouble. Um, and I think lots of times uh, when, when we start out, we don't realize that. Uh, we've got a name and hypothesis section, and, and then we'll say, uh, and then we do the analysis. Um, kind of like, if you remember the Bassomatic on Saturday Night Live, you know, where 
throw the bass into the blender and so it's a bassomatic. Uh, well, that's, that's it. Then, then we do the study, then we do the analysis, we push the blender on. That's a good way of, of uh, losing nine months out of the grant cycle. Because this is a really important section, very important section. And I think the problem is that most people don't start out now the way you are. I mean, it's more, gosh, here it is, what is it, uh, September 19th, and the deadline is October 3rd. Lily, can you help me? Uh, it's a little late to be having that discussion. I hope I don't get more emails for the October 10th. But you must be getting a gazillion. I did get some, but I haven't checked. There is one when the deadline is. And as you can tell, I mean, there I have all sorts of questions that have, we haven't gotten to the analysis yet, you know. I mean, it's, that's, I know, something that, um, you know, Lily or one of her colleagues could put together pretty quickly for me, but it's, but it's all these other things that, have to do with the design that I need help with that um, are going to take some time. And you can't even start on the analysis until you have the design right. expert or anything. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. It seems like you have a, a lot of potential confounders in terms of the disease with between traumatic brain injury and depression, and you were mentioning vets versus civilians. Are you thinking about going to a very, for a very narrow select population or taking more all-comers in terms of your enrollment? Yeah, well, I'm kind of torn because on the one hand, I'd like um, to make the enrollment as broad as possible because it's going to be easier for me to recruit. And I'd also like it to be as broad as possible because then the results are going to be as generalizable as possible. Um, but I'm worried that there may be very different responses between these subgroups. And so. I think that's kind of what I was asking. Maybe I wasn't using the right term when I wondered about stratifying. So, I mean, at minimum, I want to be sure that I don't have um, unequal numbers of these things that I think might have an important influence on outcome in the two groups. So I'd be really worried if all the people with TBI, this is an extreme, but if all the people with TBI were in the placebo group and all the people with um, out TBI were in the an empty group and the same with depression. So at least if I can be sure that those are balanced between the two groups, um, I can possibly look at some of this later on in some sort of secondary analyses. Or you could control for those confounders in your primary analysis too. And not necessarily like to stratify. Yeah, so when do I when does one go one way or the other? I mean it seems like the easy answer would be to just forget about it and just analyze it, make it part of the analytic plan, but are there some instances where that's just not going to work? I guess they're answering a different question. You're at the stratified analysis is speaking to whether it works in that population. So I guess I'm, sorry, I'm wondering whether the randomization should be stratified. Um, so when I start off that I'm sure that I'm putting equal numbers of depressed people in the two arms and equal numbers of TBI people in the two arms. With an adaptive analyzation? No, just up front. So it depends. Uh, I'm sure you have a sense of your sample size because you have a budget. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have, say, 200 patients, let's just pretend. Okay. Then when you look at all these stratification categories, so each would have two categories, say. Then you combine them, right? If you have five variables you want to stratify them, um, that's 32 combined category. So that becomes a little hard to balance within each category. As you can imagine, when somebody write down the random numbers or how to generate them, so you want to kind of make sure there's enough within each cell to be randomized. That's probably one way to see it. Okay. And would, um, would it matter how 
much I believe that that factor would influence outcome. Like if I was darn sure right. that it was going to influence outcome, then you really try to balance it. So then I would take the chance that it would just sort of work out that way. No, no, probably not. Yeah, that, that's what typically people stratify by up to a couple of variables. Just again, because how many categories that's going to generate. The really important ones. And then if I get, if it doesn't work out though, then I can adjust for it after the analysis. Sorry, what were you going to say? No, I, I'm curious as to the decision of to include the standards. So I understand your, your um, thought of, of wanting to generalize the results of the study, but if you're doing a phase 2A and you want to actually have an effect, I would, how do you make that decision of I want to generalize the study versus I want to be able to prove that there's the effect and pick the Aki population to actually show that there's an effect versus also their potential confounding issues. How do you make the decision? Yeah. Have the discussion we're having now with okay. as, many, <laughs> as many people who know the area and think about the pros and cons, and then you run out of time to decide one way or the other. So <laughs> if, you, if you have a strong theoretical basis for thinking that that the treatment effect might be different in some populations, then it would make sense to try to stratify or, or uh, separate the cohorts. But if if you don't, you know, have, have that and you're just constrained, you might as well start with the assumption that it's the same and you could look at it as a secondary, you know, analysis. You can test for heterogeneity in the treatment effect. Otherwise, to try to you know power a study to look for effects in subgroups, and, uh, if we're already constrained under sample size. Yes. Is, there, is there like a rule of thumb on, on um, how many strata you would include for like say a, a 500 patient randomized trial, 250 in each arm? You would be thinking like. At most, you would want a certain number of strata to um, uh, randomize. Okay. I can say my my, my uh, experience is just a couple of variables to stratify on. Um, for example, cancer stage or something else in the world or whatever. Um, I never quite calculated the numbers. So when you do um, the way you do randomization is you do block randomization, right? You have block instead of, of four, where within every four subjects it's balanced. So you have assignment A and B to treatment, right? So it will be maybe A, A, B, B, so it's balanced, or A, B, A, B, or A, B, B, A. So um, I guess, does that help? No, I don't know. <laughs> but it's, it has something to do with how many people are in your trial. So if you have 500 people in your trial, you may not need to stratify for anything if it's pretty common. If you've got a trial with 20 people and you think that um, you know something's really so you know I'm going to have 20 people with PTSD and I think it makes a big difference whether or not they have TBI, and I think 40% of people are going to have TBI. I damn well better stratify it, or there's a really good chance I'm going to get it balanced. But even in a large study, I mean, you can have an imbalances, undesirable imbalances, and key prognostic factors that could bias your outcome that you don't want. But the randomization process itself, particularly when your sample size is big enough, is it, sh it should do that, but it doesn't it. necessarily do it. It's a way to, because I, I mean, well, in, in cancer trials, it's routine even for very large studies to, to uh, stratify on. So, key right. it, it has to do with the model you are using. So if it's a continuous outcome, just a linear regression model, because you're just comparing the means, the t-test, then I guess there's just that one parameter or two you're estimating you mean from each group. Cancer study tend to be survival studies. In that model, there's a baseline um, parameter, baseline hazard which when you include different stage of cancer, the oncologists tend to think of there are different diseases, if they are operable or not operable. The baseline is very different. It's 
like a different intersect that you have to estimate that model. That's why they always put strata far, because it won't make sense to not put it together. Let me do a time check. We've got about five minutes for uh, this evening. Uh, and I want to make sure that the two of you you got any other things you wanted to talk about or ask each other about or from any of us. We will we will revisit part two um, on Halloween. Um, um, well, so often you're in this situation where I say you may have a study uh, idea. Um, you know you want a statistician's input, but you're you're trying to get that for a funding application, do you guys, I mean, so the denominator of unfunded studies is very large, right? So how do you, no. do you charge people for pre-grant, uh, you know, pre-award? Right, but so that was the, anyhow, just go to CTRI.ucsd, yeah. and uh, they reorganized the tasks. So now we are under data base, slash analysis, and then the first tab is biostatistics. Anyhow, you find the biostat tab and that page says you have up to four hours um, pre-award assistance that are charged. Okay. Anybody? Probably has to be a CTR member, but anybody who's on the faculty can. Is that um, for a person or for a project? <laughs> You're coming here with two projects with similar. <laughs> 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 a template that you want people to have begun filling in before they even come to see you. Would that help? Would that help you and would it help us? If you've gone through this program like this, I, I say it really helps. But usually, if the person plan an hour or 45 minutes to sit down with me, I can usually get through what I want. unless. That person doesn't know, then they go back to research the literature or something. The template usually, um, I don't know how well people will stick to it. It's our idea. Yeah, we can probably make up a list on our website once again for people to consider um, before they come to us. And yeah, we have trying to have those tutorials up, including, you know. Um, it's a sketch of the proposal we get. Similar to Murray's slides, but their ideas for the right, right. design program. Yeah. What I don't do is a stats section template. So, because each study is different, I always write on the stats section from scratch. Well, I 
I'd like to thank you both. Um, it, it, it's a very important area, and I think in a way, Murray, you, you set us up nicely for the next session. Um, if if each of you could come in with a couple slides posing the question that you really would like to help on, and, and um, I think we'll all learn a great deal just by um, watching the discussion, listening. Um, because it is theme and variation whether you're studying cancer or schizophrenia or coronary artery disease or Alzheimer's disease or HIV. These epistemological questions about how you know things, how you test it, are very important. Thank you again, both of you. Thank you. So you'll walk up the carpet for your annual work. <laughs>